please welcome Father Mike Schmitz. I think this is on. Awesome. Thank you guys um, for being here today, this morning. Just one quick announcement, announce, not an announcement, one quick note before I kind of launch in. Um, and it's just basically a thank you. Uh, I realize that every single person in this room has somewhere else they could be. Probably you have a couple dozen other places that you could be, and yet you're choosing to be here. And I just, I mean, it's worth actually stopping and saying, like, that's significant. It's significant that you're willing to say, I'm going to, you're not even sitting in the nice green chairs. You're in these ones. I'm like, oh, it's going to hurt at the end of the day. Um, but really, there's, a, there's something about that generosity, that kind of that, again, we're going to be talking about manhood all day. But there's something about this that says, I refuse to be passive. I want to be, I want to be an actor. Like, I refuse to just simply kind of just observe. What I want to do is I want to, I want to contribute. I want to do something. And your being here is a, is a sign of that. Realizing, too, that the sacrifice that you made to be here, it doesn't, it's not just like into like void. I think the sacrifice everyone made to be here, it's received by the Father. And it's going to be returned in some significant way. I think just have confidence in that. Have confidence that whatever it is, sacrifice that you made to be here today, um, the Father receives it and he's, he's going he's gonna to do something with it. He's going to do something with, with this day. So I just am really convinced of that. So... That was that. Let's launch in. Um, I am convinced that it is the, the, the duty or the job or the desire every man to have a battle to fight. I mean, maybe you've heard that, that line before, that the reality, that truth, that like, no, actually, as men, we're called. We're called to battle. We're called to actually fight. We're, I'm not actually being the man I'm called to be unless I'm in some way fighting for someone. We're going to talk about that later on today, but I think that there's a certain element that every man knows that a big part of my life, I meant to have a battle to fight. But I think one of the things the culture has done to us, I think one of the things that kind of like, you want to, if you want to say a certain kind of emasculating way that our culture has addressed us as men, is not been to say, okay, I'm going to really challenge you back. Because a challenge, we would do what? We would meet the challenge and we would rise up against it and would say, yeah, no, listen, that lie that I don't have a fight, don't have a battle, is a lie. I'm going to fight that. I think one of the ways the culture has emasculated us is this, is not to take away the fight, but to ask the question, is the fight worth it? Not to take away the battle, but to ask, are you fighting for the right thing? And then even asking the question, is there such a thing as the right thing? Does this make sense? Like, with well, that kind of idea that is this. I mean, think about a number of armed conflicts that the United States has gotten involved in. The issue is rarely, it's rarely, are we doing the right thing? The question is, is it even worth fighting for? Is there something even worth fighting for? Is, it, is there a truth that's worth fighting for? That's one of the reasons why Pope Benedict the 16th, he said, one of the great, greatest crises of our age is what he called the crisis of the tyranny of relativism. The tyranny of relativism. That there is no real truth out there, that there's only kind of the truth that you find in your heart. So here's the kind of the thing. We all hear this. I work on a university campus, and so one of the things that I hear all of the time is, well, Father, that's really nice. That's, um, that's your truth. We're never talking about anything, like when it comes to religion, when it comes to sexuality, when it comes to how to live as a human being. The Father, that's really nice. That's your truth. But my truth is something different. Have you ever, ever heard that? This is something you've heard before? So I would say this. I would say, since every man is a battle to fight, but one of the ways that we get defanged is the idea of, well, I don't know if that's the right battle. I don't know if there's anything worth fighting for. Is there such a thing as truth? I think one of the things we need to answer is, is there such a thing as truth? And not only that, but then we also have to ask the question, is what I believe, is what I base my life on, is that true? That's what I want to talk about this morning. Not only is there a truth, but also is what, does what, I, is what I base my life off, is that, is that true? So we're going to jump into that. That's what we're going to do. So we're going to first have to answer the question, okay, 
If we're asking the question, well, that's your truth, this is my truth, what is truth? The answer is, the first question is, what is truth? You're going to hear Pontius Pilate say this in about a week from now. The question, what is truth? And so this is one of those like, oh gosh, is he going to talk like philosophy and stuff? And it's going to be all like, I thought it's only 8.30. Like this is ridiculous. I'm going to make it really simple. I'm going to make it completely accessible. I would say truth can be boiled down to two words. Truth can be defined as what is. Simple, super simple. Truth can be defined as what is. So um, a statement is either true or false to the degree that it conforms to what is. So a statement is either true or false to the degree that it conforms to what is. So if I were to say um, there is a speaker on this stage that conforms to what is. So there is a speaker on the stage. That statement is true to the degree that it conforms to what is. But if I were to say there are two speakers on this stage, that, that statement would conform even more closely to what is. Does that make sense? Really simple. Truth is simply what is. And a statement is either true or false to the degree that it conforms to reality, that to the degree that it conforms to what is. And yet, and yet we still have people who say, you, I mean, there are people who could even say to me, well, Father, that's your truth that there's only two speakers on the stage. To me, there's more. Or to me, there's less. Okay, well, let's look at that. Um, let's do a little, let's do a little, that was a little philosophy. Truth is what is. Let's do grammar. Let's actually look at like the English language. Here's a number of statements. Here's a statement. Someone could say this. Someone could say, uh, I like Diet Coke more than Diet Pepsi. I prefer, prefer uh, Caribou coffee to Starbucks coffee. I like Papa John's more than Domino's pizza. I like driving a little bit over the speed limit. No, all of those statements can be true. Those are what, they, those are what you call subjective statements. And they're subjective statements. Why? Because they're all about who? They're all about me. They're all about the subject. I'm the subject. And I say, I like Diet Coke more than Diet Pepsi. I like Caribou Coffee more than Starbucks. I like to drive a little bit over the speed limit. I like to Papa Murphy's or Papa John's more than Domino's Pizza. They're all about me. So you could hear that and say, well, Father, that's true for you. And I'd say, uh-huh. But it's not true for me. Fine, whatever. Because there is such a thing. There is such a thing as truth that's true for you, but not true for me. For example, you might like driving the speed limit. I have no idea why, but go ahead. <laughs> You're the guy I'm passing. <laughs> but this recognition of there is such a thing as true for you, but not true for me. That's when it comes. Those are things we call subjective truths. But there's another kind. There's a different kind of truth. It's called Objective truth. There's such a thing as objective statements. Statements like this. A medium coffee at Caribou costs 214, unless you get the trivia question right, then it's 204. To say that you can get two one-topping pizzas at Domino's on Tuesdays for 14.99. The statement that says, out in front of the school, the speed limit is 35 miles an hour. Now, all of those things, the crazy thing about objective statements, objective truths, is objective truths are true or false, regardless of whether I like it, know it, or believe it. I'm going to say that again. Objective statements are either true or false, regardless of whether I know it, whether I like it, or whether I believe it. So as an example, if we're here in this room, you cannot see the outside. If, unfortunately, it started snowing, it would be tragic. But we'd be here in the inside all day. We could walk outside at the end of the day. Imagine how sad you'd be walking outside at the end of the day and it, there's six inches of snow on the ground. Now, because we didn't know it, would we be like, no, it's not snowing outside. I don't know that. No, so because objective reality doesn't care about whether you know it. Objective reality, objective truth is true or false regardless of whether you know it. It's also regardless of whether or not you like it. We have, we have students um, at, at the University of Minnesota, Duluth. Um, they have, because we're in Duluth, we, there's a tunnel system. Like basically every building and every dorm is connected to each other. You could feasibly arrive as a freshman on the first day of class and never go outside until Thanksgiving break. You could do that if you wanted to because everything's connected by tunnels. And so you could, you know, live indoors and say, why? Because I don't like the fact that in... Minnesota, 
you have winter that starts on September 3rd. So someone could say, well, yeah, but if that's the case, if it's true or if it's false, I can't, it doesn't matter whether I like it or not. So it th because the thing is true or false, objectively true or false, regardless of whether I know it, whether I like it, or whether I even believe it. You could go in, you walked in the door, it was sunny out, it was getting warm, you heard it was going to get warm, and all of a sudden the temperatures plummet, and it's now, you know, 20 below outside, and you say, I don't believe you, I don't believe you, I don't believe you. Now, if it's cold outside, does it matter? Does the temperature even change a bit if you don't believe that it's cold? Absolutely not. Why? Because objective truth is either true or false, regardless of whether you know it, like it, or believe it. Okay, so you have two things, subjective truth and objective truth. Here's a little back to philosophy. There is this thing we call the principle of non-contradiction. The principle of non-contradiction states this. A thing cannot both be and not be at the same time and in the same way. Now, here's, here's why I'm going over this stuff in the beginning. I'm going over this stuff in the beginning because this. Because at some point, you and I are going to get into a, into a situation where we say, like, well, I know that's what I believe, but I can't just, I can't just share what I believe because it's just what I believe. It's all it is is just what I believe. And so I can't get to a place where I'm actually going to risk my life or stake my faith or even risk my family on just something I personally believe. Unless what? Unless it's objectively true. Unless that I know that it's true. So there's this thing called the principle of non-contradiction, as I said. And the principle of non-contradiction means this. A thing cannot both be and not be at the same time and in the same way. I'm going to say that like five more times. A thing cannot both be and not be at the same time and in the same way. So, for example, these lights cannot both be on and not be on at the same time. Now, I always have a, like a, a smart alecky student who like says, well, Father, what about this? What if you took a lamp and you put it, you turned it off, but then put it on the table? It's both off and on at the same time. And I was like, yes. And the contradiction principle says, and in the same way, moron. No, <laughs> it's, it cannot be both true and not true at the same time and in the same way. So this is one of these crazy things. At the university, at UMD, not Detroit, but Duluth, at the University of Minnesota Duluth, there was a professor who, was, who had to teach this idea to college students and was saying, what we need to do is we need to learn how to identify the difference between subjective statements and objective statements. And so what he was doing is he was throwing on the screen like all these statements and the class had to say, that's objective, that's subjective. And they were nailing them. I mean, they, because it's, they're kind of obvious, right? Objective, subjective, objective, subjective. And then he put one statement on the board that said, God exists. And it was all of a sudden, it was like no one could think. It was like brains were like breaking down, you know, kind of this. Because why? Because we're like, well, that's subjective. Because we've been brainwashed. That's clearly, God exists. Is that a subjective or an objective statement? Objective. It's objective. And yet, well, I don't know, because some people don't believe that. But the statement wasn't, I like the idea that God exists. The statement, I mean, you could say that. You could, you could have a subjective statement that says, you know, the idea that God exists and is everywhere and always watching me just fills me with a lot of peace and warmth and joy. Someone else could say, well, that's very nice, but the idea that God exists and he's always watching me really creeps me out. That can be true for you and not true for me. But the statement, God exists, and yet the statement, God doesn't exist, cannot both be true. Because why? The principle of non-contradiction that says a thing cannot both be and not be at the same time and in the same way. And so either God exists or God doesn't exist. But it can't be true for you but not true for me because that is not a subjective statement. It is a statement that is objective. Not only is it a statement that's objective, it's a statement that changes everything about our lives. Here's what I mean. A number of years ago, I was doing marriage prep with this couple, and uh, she was raised Catholic and still went to Mass and practiced her faith. He was raised Catholic and then just abandoned the whole thing and was a pretty, like, committed atheist. Like, I do not believe that God exists. And so this, I thought, this is an issue. We should address this at some point in our marriage prep. So I was just looking for the opening, looking for the opening, and finally, I was like, you know, I just, I can't find an opening. I'm going to make an opening. <laughs> I said, okay, we need to talk about this. How have you both reconciled 
the fact that when it comes to the most important question in life, you think the other person is completely wrong. Because here she is, and she believes that God exists, and here he is, and he believes God does not exist. And I think my, my future spouse is completely wrong when it comes to this question. Like, how have you, well, you know, our kids, no, 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 how do you two, how are you two going to reconcile the truth that you think the person you're going to commit your life to is completely wrong and the most important question in life? And I love, his answer was this, well, I don't, his answer was, well, I don't think it's the most important question in life. I was like, well, that's the problem. Because you have staked your life on the, this claim that God doesn't exist, and you haven't even followed it through to the conclusion. You've staked your claim on the idea that God does not exist, and you've never followed it through to the logical conclusions. Now, there's a lot of logical conclusions, but I'm just going to jump to the end. Here's one of them. If God does not exist, this world is meaningless. I was talking to a young man just last week about this. I said um, the same thing. I said, you know, because he's like, I don't believe God exists, etc. I said, well, you know, if you don't believe God exists, this world is absolutely meaningless. And he said, yeah, but it's, it's, it's beautiful meaningless. And I said, come here. I'm going to punch you in the face. <laughs> it's beautifully, beautifully meaningless. Like, what, do you, what does that even mean? It's beautifully meaningless. Well, just there's so much beauty out there. Like, no, it's just crap. Like, honestly, the idea is this. If God does not exist, that means everything that does exist is an accident. If God doesn't exist, that means this whole universe just happened to happen. And it's just completely an accident. So, yeah, no, but I find meaning in this. That's what the young man, the, the, the groom, well, you know, I find meaning in things. So I said, okay. A number of years ago, we have a FOCUS team on our campus. FOCUS stands for the Fellowship of Catholic University Students. They're missionaries on our campus. It was aw- they're fantastic. They're awesome. And I met them for the first time down in North Carolina, this team we had a couple years ago. And so we needed to have, like, uh, they wanted us to bond together. So we had a team bonding activity. So we went out, and we went to an art show because there's, there's nothing that bonds people more together than, than shared suffering. And... <laughs> I mean, I like, I like art, but this was a postmodern art show. So, you know, like you, you walk in like, oh, there's a toilet. Oh, nice. Oh, that's the art. Okay, I didn't realize. I thought I was just challenged here. Can you go in the middle of the room? Like, no. Um, but I was walking through this room, and at one point, I came upon this huge canvas. It was maybe 15 foot by 15 foot, and it was just of the color red. And like three little smudges somewhere in there. And it was actually really striking. I mean, it, was a, it was a beautiful shade of red and really big. And so I stood there and just kind of like, just looked at it. But I didn't just stand there and look at it like a moron. I stood there and looked at it like an art person. You know how that, that is? Kind of back on one foot, stroking my chin, <laughs> nodding. Mm, right. Art. So... I must, have, I must have looked like I knew what I was doing because these two men walked up and they saw me standing there. They were kind of like looking at me, looking at the... So they kind of sidled up and... What do you see? Honestly, for the next 15 minutes, I described the color red. Well, it's just, it's just, this red is just like rage or passion. Or, and I think this smudge means this, but then it gets a little bigger, you see? And the smudge means this and... Honestly, 30 minutes of my life looking at red. Now, I even described it and said, this is what it means. Question. If I wanted to know what the painting really, really meant, who would I have to talk to? The artist, obviously. No, I found my meaning in it. But if I wanted to know what the painting means, I have to talk to the artist. Now, would it be funny if she walked in and I said, so I've been looking at your painting for 15 minutes. I think it means this, this, this. And she were to say, actually, funny story. I had my canvas all laid out on the ground. I was going to paint a landscape. But I've got these cats. And the cats knocked over all this red paint all over the canvas. I was super mad, but I I hung up the painting. And it just kind of dried in this way. I thought, well, that's really compelling. So I put it in the art show. (laughs) So so the painting is an accident. Yeah, but it's a beautiful accident. So the painting's meaningless. Yeah, but it's beautifully meaningless. 
I'm like, oh no, so basically your painting means nothing. Even if it's an accident, even if I find meaning in the painting, if it's an accident, does there have meaning? No, not at all. There might be subjective meaning, but is there any objective meaning? Absolutely not. And if this universe has no creator, if this universe has no person who said, I'm going to do this on purpose, that means this universe is on accident. And if it's not on purpose, there is no meaning at all. So I'm talking to this, married, this couple that's planning to get married, saying, when it comes to the most important question of life, you disagree. I don't believe it's the most important question. Well, bride, do you realize that your groom, ultimately, if he, if he followed his beliefs to the logical conclusions, he believes that his vows to you are ultimately meaningless. He believes that your, little, your children that you may have together, when he holds your child in his hands, that that child is ultimately meaningless. That your life together will ultimately be meaningless. Versus you, who says, I'm going to stand up in front of everyone in this church, and I'm going to promise the rest of my life to this man. Why? Because I believe life has purpose. I mean, there's, this, there's, there's so much, there is so many conclusions, so much that can happen if we follow our conclusions, or our beliefs to the logical conclusions. And if there is no meaning, there is no battle that's worth fighting. If there's no God, there's no battle that's worth fighting. If there's no purpose, there's no battle that is worth fighting. And you can have the heart of a lion, you can have the heart of a lamb, it doesn't matter. Because why? Because if there is no God, there is nothing worth fighting for. Because there is no meaning and no purpose. The principle of non-contradiction says a thing cannot both be and not be at the same time and in the same way. And all of the evidence, all the evidence points to the objective statement, the objective truth that in fact God does exist. Why? How, do I, how can I say this? For many, many reasons. I could go through all the arguments. I'm not going to do that this morning. But because of this, our experience, even just if you look at human experience, what do you find? You find that if someone is going to, going to embrace the idea of meaninglessness, they have to get around all of the meaning that they find in life. If someone's going to embrace the idea of meaningless, they have to reject every corner of this universe that screams out, there's meaning, there's purpose, there's a creator. You have to reject that. You have to be willing to do that. I mean, the, <laughs> this, the, I, think it's, I think it's remarkable that people would say, well, no, this universe just happened by accident. And yet, if you were not walking in the woods, like just had a little break this afternoon, and you walked, you know, went, I'm going to go walk in the woods a little bit, and you came upon like a paper clip lying on the ground, you wouldn't be like, oh my gosh, what is this? There must have been like an aluminum spring somewhere around here that just bubbled up and just cooled in the shape of this, you know, metal twisty thing. If you were to see something as simple as a paper clip, you'd say, oh, someone did that. Someone made that. I see an effect. There must have been a cause that was on purpose because this looks like it has purpose. And yet we look at the human eye and we say, well, that was an accident. What? Look, think about even the human brain. Now hear about this. Actually, do this, please. Don't just think about the human brain. Think about your human brain. Like right now where you're sitting. Think about your brain in your head. Okay, now, think about the fact that, you're, that the thing you're thinking about is the thing you're thinking with. Now, think about the fact that you're thinking about the fact that the thing you're thinking about is the thing you're thinking with. Like, it's one of these great, and oh, and that happened by accident. There, we do this for nothing except for the biggest things. Whenever we find anything that has meaning, anything that has design, we say there was a designer, there was a creator. Except when it comes to the biggest things. All the universe screams out, God exists. The entire universe screams out, God exists. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to put a pin in that right now. I'm going to put a pin in this and say, okay, we know that truth is defined as what is. We know that there's subjective truth. Yep, what's true for you, not true for me. We also know there's objective truth, things that are true regardless of whether I know it, like it, or believe it. And we also could maybe even stake a claim, I would say we can positively stake a claim, that the truth, true objective statement, God exists, is a true statement. But here, that doesn't answer any questions for us. That still doesn't mean we have a battle to fight, because I don't know who to fight for. 
or what to fight for. So I have a lot of students and maybe a lot of people in this room. We say, well, fine, Father, that's wonderful. God exists. But how do you know which religion is true? Okay, God exists, but like, I don't know. I was raised Catholic, so what I need to do, what I need to do is I need to research every world religion and then find out what's true in them, what's false in them, and then, then I can maybe make a commitment to one of them. That seems like a smart thing to do. Actually, it seems like a really reasonable thing to do. It seems like if I'm going to do this, I'm going to research every world religion, study them all, and then make my, make my decision. I think that sounds smart. Because I, mean, I took world religion classes in, in college, and I took world religion classes in seminary. And I know how it goes. Like, have you ever, have you ever, has anyone here ever taken a world religion class? Okay, a number of people here. So you probably know how it goes too. You get a, you get a textbook, and every chapter is a different religion. So you have Buddhism and Confucianism and Taoism and Islam and Judaism and Christianity and Zoroastrianism and whatever else, you know. And basically it just says, okay, here's what this teaches. Here's what this teaches. You need to study this. You need to learn this. You need to know this. And then you can decide. The problem is this. The problem is in that book or in the world religions class, it treats Christianity just like any other religion. And I'm going to make the claim that it can't because Christianity is a profoundly different religion than any other world religion. He's like, of course you say that. You're a priest. Like, no, I'm a priest because that's true. Here's what I mean. Every other world religion, I mean, this is, I would tell you this. If you want to find out whether Christianity is true, you do not have to study every other world religion. All you have to do is answer one question. If you're, if you're going to want to know whether Christianity is true or false, you do not have to study every other world religion. You have to answer one question, and that's it, one question. Because every other world religion is what? Every other world religion is someone comes along and says, I have insight into God. Wrote it down. Here it is. Or someone says, I have a revelation from God, and I wrote it down, and here it is. And then Jesus comes along, and he says what? Does he say, I have a revelation from God, or I have insight into God? Jesus comes along, and he says, I am God. So the only question you have to answer, the only question we have to answer, is not, are those other revelations, other insights true? All we have to answer is, Jesus claimed to be God. Is that true, or is that false? Because you cannot both be true and false at the same time. It can't be true for you and not true for me. It's an objective statement. So the question we have to answer is, is Jesus who he says he is? And for a lot of you, this might be like totally basic. For a lot of you, this might be like, well, I totally know the answer to this question. I've studied this. But here's what I want to do. If you're not in that place, it's good to hear. If you are in that place, it's good to be reminded so you can go, go do something with it. So how many of us say, no, I'm a, I'm a Catholic man. I'm a man who believes in Jesus Christ. But if someone were to ask you, well, why? I, um, the Lions. The Packers. The Vikings. Yeah. So here's an answer. I mean, this is re remarkable. The fact that we need, we need an answer to this question. Is Jesus who he says he is? You can actually answer this question. Because, I mean, there will be people, and I'll talk to them on the college campus. That's who I work with mostly, is my college students. And they'll say things like, well, Father, you know, I loved your service. You know, the, the, that, that whole, like, what's called Mass, that was really nice. Um, and I really respect Jesus. I think he was a holy person. I just don't believe he was God. Have you ever heard anyone say that? Like, I think Jesus was a prophet. He's a holy person, but he wasn't God. You know, the funny thing about this, that's the one thing you can't say about Jesus. You can't say, one of the things you can't say about Jesus is that he was a holy person, a prophet, but not God. Here's why. Because Jesus claimed to be God. If Jesus claimed to be God, and he wasn't God, and he knew he wasn't God, what is he? He's a liar. He's lying. He claimed to be God. He knew he wasn't God. He's lying. What if Jesus claimed to be God and he didn't know he wasn't God? He's, he's crazy. He's loony. Yeah, he's disconnected from reality. The only, op the only other option we have is that, that Jesus claimed to be God 
and he was God. So let's, have, let's look at this question. Let's look at this and say, okay, was, maybe Jesus was a liar. I mean, we've met liars before. You know, it's really interesting. If you do studies on the, pro, the psychological profile of pathological liars, what you find about them is that they are narcissistic, they are self-involved, they are self-concerned, they are completely uncreative, they lack compassion, and yet every time you read the Bible and look at Jesus, what do you see? You see a person who's incredibly creative. You see a person who's completely the opposite of selfish, but selfless. You find someone who's overwhelmingly compassionate. Remember that story? Where Jesus has been working hard, he's been going at it, he's been healing people and caring for them, and he says to his disciples, let's go across the, the, the sea, let's, we, we gotta rest. And he comes up on the shore of the lake, and he sees this huge crowd of people who just need help, and he says, backpedal, backpedal, reverse, reverse. No, it says his heart was moved with pity for them. They were like sheep without a shepherd. And he says, we've got to land here. We've got to heal these people. We've got to help these people. Here's a person who does not fit the profile of a liar. So maybe, well, maybe, maybe he's genuine. Maybe he really believes he's God, even though he's not. Maybe, maybe he's claiming to be God. He's not God, but he doesn't know that. Now, I think this is really interesting. Because if truth is what is, and a statement is either true or false to, to the degree that it conforms to reality, our minds, if we can't conform to reality, we're not really connected to reality. I'm not sure if you caught that. So, for example, I could come along and say, I'm a priest. And you'd say, okay, that seems accurate. If I were to say, you guys, I am like the best priest in the world. And I really thought that, pretty soon you'd be like, okay, there's something off with that guy. If I were to say, everyone... I am Pope Francis. Hola. And I really, and I really believe that I was Pope Francis. I walked around, hello, hola, como se dice? Pretty soon, you talking to me for a little while, you'd be like, okay, that guy's, that guy's kind of, he's not connected to reality. If I were to walk along and say, um, hello, everyone, um, I am Marie Antoinette. Have some cake. <laughs> Pretty quickly, as you, if you talked with me, you'd be like, okay, that guy, that, no, he's not legit. If I were to say, hello, everyone, I am a jelly donut. And I really believe that I was a jelly donut, like I'm that disconnected from reality, that it would be pretty easy to spot that that guy's nuts. Jesus comes on the scene, and he doesn't say that he's just a prophet or a holy person. Jesus doesn't claim even to be like a butterfly. Jesus claims to be the person who made everything in the world. Like he's basically, Jesus says, hello, everyone. I am the way, the truth, and the life. What's that mean? Well, do you see that big yellow thing in the sky? I did that. <laughs> Jesus comes on the scene. He claims to be God. Now, if you're not disconnected from reality by claiming to be the source of everything that exists, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. What? <laughs> Pretty soon you'd be able to realize that Jesus is not connected to reality. But he does not seem the record to be someone who's a liar. He does not seem to be someone who's disconnected from reality. It seems that there's only one option left, that he actually is who he says he is. No, I know that right now you'd be like, oh, okay, I guess he's not a liar. He's not a lunatic. He must be the Lord. No, because what happens is this. What happens is if anyone came on the scene, walked in the room and just jumped up on stage and said, by the way, everyone, before Abraham was, I am. What's that mean? That means I'm God. Would we just say, oh, okay. I think sometimes we think that the, the, like the early Christians, that that was kind of their thing. Well, they were just so dumb back then. You know, they didn't know anything. Jesus comes and says, I'm God. And they're like, okay, Jesus. You know, this kind of a... <laughs> because really, I mean, I think way back then, they were idiots. I mean, they didn't know how to program VCRs. They didn't know how to use iPods. They didn't know anything. No, but that's not how they did it. When Jesus came on the scene and said he was God, what did they say? They said what we would say. Jesus says, I'm God. Says, oh, yeah? Well, then prove it. That's what happens in the Bible all over and over again. In Mark chapter 2, Jesus has this scene. He's teaching and healing people in this house. And there's these four friends and they have a paralyzed friend. Remember that story? And they can't get through the door. So what do they do? They go up on the roof and they do some remodeling. I always think this is just one of those stories where you're like, if you're the guy who has that house, you're like, what? You? They're opening up the roof like, are you? Um, what? They lower him down. And Jesus doesn't even say like, hey, you have a skylight. It's okay. He says, Jesus looks at the four friends, sees their faith, and looks at the man and says, your sins are forgiven. 
And all the people are like, whoa, 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 whoa. Who but God can forgive sins? Jesus is like, I know, right? (laughs) He says, yeah, that's right. To prove to you, though, that I have the authority, that I am who I say I am, I will say to the man, rise, pick up your mat, and walk. And the guy does it. Because that's what the miracles are. In fact, in John's gospel, the miracles are not just miracles. They're not just big, wow, jazz hands. The miracles, John calls them signs and wonders. Why? Because signs point to something. What do they point to? The fact that Jesus is who he says he is. That's why he does the miracles, because he loves people, but also because he needs to prove, I am who I say I am, because why? I'm claiming to be something you've never met before. Not just a prophet, not just someone with, with revelation, but God himself. So he goes around, goes around all over the place, and he does these healings. You know, like there, there's the man who's deaf and he can't speak. I remember that, remember that scene where Jesus goes up to the man who's deaf and he can't speak, and he like, puts his fingers in his ears and touches his tongue, and I always... Wonder, like, what did that guy think as Jesus is walking towards him? He's like, no, come here, closer, come here, let me just, let me just. He's deaf, he's like, I don't know what's happening right now. Jesus is like, let me touch your tongue. What is happening, Jesus? I like, but he says, be open, and the guy can hear, the guy can speak. Um, that, remember that one scene where there's a 12-year-old girl, and her dad rushes to Jesus and says, my daughter's ill, she's sick, she's dying. And Jesus goes to her side, but she's already dead. And he takes her by the wrist and he says two words. He just says, he, he doesn't take her by the wrist and then like check her pulse and the airway, breathing, circulation and start doing some CPR. Like, breathe. You've never given up anything before in your life. He just takes her by the wrist and says, Talitha Kum, little girl, arise. And the dead girl is alive. And this happens again and again. I mean, there's this one huge scene in, in John's gospel. It's John chapter 11. Where there's, these, uh, there's this guy, his name's Lazarus. Remember that uh, Lazarus has two sisters? Their names are Mary and Martha. And Mary and Martha send word to Jesus and said, Laz- uh, Jesus, your friend, Lazarus, the one you love, he's dying. And so Jesus takes his time. <laughs> like, oh, nice guy, Jesus. Um, he finally gets there and they, Martha goes out to meet him and says, he's dead. If you would have been here, he wouldn't have died. Mary goes out, Jesus says, Take me to him. Take me to the tomb. And this is worth like pressing pause for a second. They bring him to the tomb of this man that Jesus was friends with, that Jesus cared about, who's dead. And even though, crazy, this is crazy, even though Jesus knew what he was going to do, even though he knew that in just like a sec- couple seconds, the guy's going to be alive. His heart was moved with compassion. His heart was broken. And there's the shortest verse in all of scriptures, two words. Just the verse, Jesus wept. Because why? Because here is a God, I know what I'm going to do. But listen, you're hurting right now, that means I'm hurting right now. I think a lot of times we can make it so that God has no compassion on us. Because why? Because, well, don't worry, there's heaven. Jesus, I, I am struggling so bad right now. Don't worry, there's heaven. Jesus, I am so, my wife, she just took off. I have no idea what, don't worry, there's heaven. Jesus, I've lost everything. And I, have, I don't know how to, don't worry, there's, that's not what God says. Even though he knows he's going to raise Lazarus in just a couple of seconds from now, when he encounters your suffering, our suffering, death, heartbreak, his heart breaks. And then he says, throw away the stone. I love this, the next line. <laughs> it says, roll away the stone. And the people go up to Jesus. And remember how, de- how long Lazarus has been dead? Four days, right. So they're like, um, Master or Lord, he's been dead for four days. It's, it's going to smell. Because these people, I mean, unlike us, like we, you know, when we're dying, we go to a nursing home or a, a hospice place. And then the funeral home people take care of us. And then, and then no one has to touch anybody. But back then... I mean, you died in the living room, and then you were prepared for burial in the living room, and then your family and friends carried your body. They knew what dead looked like. They knew what dead, sound, they knew what the dead smelled like. Master, there's going to be a stench. Jesus is like, stand back, roll away the stone. And then rather than like with the little girl taking a rather wrist, Jesus does this remote control resuscitation where he just stands outside the tomb and he says three words. He says, Lazarus, come out. And then he says, John says, 
Then the dead man walked out of the tomb. I always like the understatement of the apostles. <laughs> and then the dead man walked out of the tomb, and Jesus said, untie him and let him go free. And then we did the night, and then we had lunch. It was a great day. Like, what is happening? I would be like, if I was writing this gospel, I'd be like, underline, exclamation mark, and then the dead man walked out of the tomb. And then it says this. It's remarkable. It says, many of the people who had come to Mary and Martha and seen what he had done began to believe in him. But then, from that day on, the others planned to kill him. So from this moment, Jesus has now proven he is who he says he is. From that moment on, many of those came to believe in him. But from that day on, others planned to kill him. Because this is the thing about Jesus. When it comes to almost any other thing in life, someone's excited about. You know, someone says, oh my gosh, you need to see. Are you, are, have you watched The Walking Dead? Maybe you check an episode like, mm, yeah, meh. Or someone says, well, have you, have you gone... Have you ever gone to a whatever, whatever game? Yeah, I did. It was kind of whatever. Like about almost everything people get excited about, you could say, meh. You could say, whatever. Jesus is like maybe the only thing in the universe that you can say, you can't say meh to. Or can't say whatever to. It's either this. It's either I believe in him or kill him. It's a crossroads. There's a cross. There's a crux. It's either I believe in him or kill him. And that's what they do. We know the story. It happened. We're going to celebrate this, commemorate this in two weeks from now. Jesus goes to Jerusalem and they arrest him and they torture him and they crucify him and they kill him. And then what happens on the third day? He rises from the dead. To do what? To prove that he is who he says he is. You know, at this point, people say, well, yeah, maybe the... Maybe the apostles just made that up. Maybe the apostles just made up the whole idea that he rose from the dead. Well, I would go with that if that's what the story looked like. Like if it was like, and then he rose from the dead, and we were all like, yeah, let's have ice cream. Like, how does the story actually turn out? Does it look like, I mean, if you, when you read the resurrection story, does it look like anyone was expecting that to happen? Isn't it, have you ever, does, think about this. How many times did Jesus say, okay, guys, here's what's going to happen. I'm going to go to Jerusalem. Then they're going to arrest me. Then they're going to torture me. They're going to kill me. Don't worry. I'm going to rise on the third day. And then when it happens, they're like, what's happening? What's going on? I'm like, honestly, you get <laughs> on the third day, on, on Sunday, Easter Sunday morning, the women are going to the tomb. Why? Not because they're like, hey, he said Sunday. He's going to rise from the dead. Let's go there. No, they're going to the tomb because they're going to continue to anoint his body. Why? Because he did. And when they get there and the tombs roll back, the stones roll back from the tomb, it's not like they're like, oh, yeah, that's right. They're like, what's happening? Why is the tomb? You know, they walk in and the tomb's empty. And it wasn't like they were all like, oh, yeah. They're like, what's going on? Even Mary Magdalene is in the garden and she sees Jesus. It's not like she's like, oh, yeah. She's like, you're the gardener. Where did you take his body? I love this because then this says Jesus looked at Mary and, he, and he's like, Mary. And she's like, oh, Rabbi and I. You know, Mary runs back to the apostles. They, Jesus is alive again. And it wasn't like they were like, oh, yeah. They're like, no, no. So what happens? Not even all of them run to the tomb. Two of them. Out of all the apostles and all the disciples, Peter and John run to the tomb to check it out because everyone else is saying like, nope, nope, nope. Doesn't happen. Doesn't happen. Oh, I know we healed that other person and raised them from the dead, but this doesn't happen. They go to the tomb and they look inside, and it wasn't like they looked into the tomb and said, oh, yeah. An angel had to show up and be like, okay, McFly, do you remember how he said this? They're like, I guess, kind of. You know, and they, it says they, wa they went back to the other apostles bewildered and befuddled until that afternoon. And they're all in the upper room, and the doors are locked. Except for one guy who isn't there, Thomas. And Jesus appears to them. And even then, there wasn't like, they were like, oh, yeah. They were like, is it a ghost? And he's like, just give me some food. I'll watch. I can eat stuff. Like, I'm not a ghost. So he leaves. 
And then Thomas comes home. I always like to imagine the moment when Thomas walks, Thomas walks in the door. Like he just, you know, kind of does the secret knock kind of thing. And they're like, welcome. He's getting groceries or something. You know, he's out on an errand. They're like, Thomas, Jesus was here. I can imagine like, oh, man, I missed him. No, because Thomas, when he, Thomas hears that Jesus was resurrected, he's like, nope, nope, nope. Doesn't happen. Doesn't happen. Why? It just doesn't happen. He says, you remember what Thomas even says? I'm not going to believe this unless I what? <laughs> Stick my fingers in the holes in his hands and my hand in the spear mark in his side. I'm like, Thomas, you are sick. You are. That's disgusting. How about like, unless I give him a hug or something. So seven days later, a week passes, and it says in Scripture in John's Gospel, it says, the disciples are gathered together, and this time Thomas is with them. And Jesus appears. <laughs> I can imagine if you were Thomas at this moment, like, oh. Oh, no. <laughs> this time Thomas is with them, and Thomas appears, and he says, Jesus looks at Thomas, and he says, Tommy, put her there. <laughs> and Thomas falls to his knees, and he says five words. My Lord and my God. My Lord and my God. See, Jesus, what he's done at this moment, he has proven objectively I am who I say I am. Objective truth. The objective truth about Jesus is I am the Lord. I am God. But at this moment, at this moment for Thomas, that objective truth has become a subjective truth. Where it's not just the truth out there, it's now the truth of my whole life. Not just the truth of life, it's the truth of my life. That Jesus is not just the Lord and not just the God. Jesus is now my Lord. Jesus is now my God. And you know what Thomas did? Thomas from this moment on, living with Jesus for the next 40 days and then receiving the Holy Spirit at Pentecost, that's changed Thomas's heart to the heart of a lion. Because Jesus is not just the Lord and the God. He's now my Lord. He's now my God. And I'm going to fight for that truth with my whole life. My whole life. Thomas went to India. <laughs> and he brought the gospel to that place. And he just, I mean, there are still Christians there in India now. Who they're Christians because Thomas didn't just believe the objective truth that Jesus is the God and the Lord, but because Thomas was willing to say, no, Jesus is my God and he's my Lord. The objective truth and the subjective truth is now the reality of my life and the thing I'm going to fight for my whole life. And this is the last thing. How do you do this? I think this is worth starting the day off with. I mean, we're going to talk about a lot of stuff today. But I think it's, it's worth to say, okay, the whole day is going to be based off of this. This truth that Jesus not only is the God and the Lord, but he's my God, he's my Lord. How do I, how do I make that leap? How do I make that step? I would do it like this. Y'all ever seen The Lord of the Rings? You've seen The Lord of the Rings? So in the first movie, The Fellowship of the Ring, there's this moment when Frodo gets the ring. They're at Rivendell. And Frodo, now Frodo, you know, Tolkien was a Catholic. You probably all know that. Tolkien, actually his mom was a martyr for the Catholic faith. His mom was a martyr for the Catholic faith, and he was raised by a priest. And Tolkien said that the Lord of the Rings is essentially a Catholic book. And there's many Christ figures in the Lord of the Rings. One of them is a guy named Frodo. And Frodo is a hobbit who, cares, who bears the ring. The ring is a symbol of sin in Middle Earth. It's a symbol of sin in the world. And so Frodo has to say, I'm going to carry the sin that's in the world, and I'm going to destroy it. I'm going to carry it up the mountain. Does it sound familiar? I'm carry it up a mountain, and on the top of that mountain, I'm going to destroy the power of sin in this world. But at one point, Frodo says, I'll do it. I'll go. But I don't know the way. And that's the moment when Aragorn, who's one of the other Christ figures, does this. He kneels in front of Frodo and he says this. He says, if by my life or by my death, I can help you to accomplish this task, you have my sword. If by my life or by my death, I can help you accomplish this task, you have my sword. I would say, men, if you want to say, I know that Jesus is not just the Lord and the God, but he's my Lord and my God, I invite you to make this decision interiorly with your whole life. To be able to kneel before Jesus and say, if by my life or by my death, I can help you, Jesus, to accomplish your mission, you have my life. 
Jesus' mission is to redeem the world, and he doesn't do it on his own. He gathers men around him, and then he fills those men, and he sends those men out. So we can say this morning, we can kneel before the Lord and say, if by my life or by my death, I can help you to accomplish this, your mission, Jesus, then you have my life. You are the God. You are the Lord. And Lord Jesus, you are my God and my Lord. And now I have a battle that is worth fighting for.